Hello, and uh, welcome to this introductory video about the Dimensions APIs. Um, my name is Michele Pazin. I'm the Head of Data Architecture and Insights at Dimensions. I work for Digital Science. And uh, in, the, uh, um, in this slide deck I put together, I will give you an overview of what the Dimensions APIs are and why they can be a useful solution for your research data analytics problems. Right, so first of all, I assume most of you know already what Dimensions is. Um, so Dimensions delivers an array of search and discovery analytical and research management tools all within a single platform. And uh, I may say one of the uh, most distinctive features of Dimensions is the fact that it contains different uh, content types. We have information about publications, grants, patents, clinical trials, policy documents, very recently data sets, and of course, researchers. And all of this information is uh, not just existing uh, in an isolated format, but it's actually uh, um, linked uh, to each other via millions and millions of different relationships. Um, by using the web application, by using the web app you see depicted here on the right hand side, you can highlight many of the links. You can reveal many of the links between the different content types and you can come up with very interesting analysis. Uh, but uh, I would say that only by using a tool like the API, uh, the full power of the links, the full power of the analytics can be built on top of these links, can be, uh, um, can be revealed. Um, so that, from my perspective, is, mo it is the most interesting fact about the API. Um, you can use it in order to jump from one content type to the other and to then uh, produce interesting statistics based on these relationships. So right, first of all, I should also clarify um, what an API is, since we're talking about APIs. So in a nutshell, an API is a programmatic way to access some data or to access a functionality. Very often, this functionality exists over the web. So it's a programmatic way to access some functionalities using the standard web interface, the standard way of communicating over the web, which is HTTP. Um, so the Dimensions APIs, like many other APIs, they allow to carry out sophisticated um, data operations. In the case of Dimensions, we're talking about research data and anal analysis tasks. And um, I think it's useful to think of the uh, three main uh, groups of actions uh, that can be done with Dimensions APIs, just to set the scene and uh, clarify a little bit what is it that people can achieve by using APIs. So the most, uh, um, a very common use case is to use the API to uh, query the Dimensions database um, using some uh, queries by asking some questions that are relatively complex. Uh, maybe uh, queries that have a lot of constraints, so you may be putting a lot of, uh, uh, using a lot of keywords, or maybe you may be using a lot of parameters to do your search, and a, a very complex set of AND and OR uh, logical connectives. And so these queries you know, are much easier to formulate if you use the API. And this is even uh, uh, more important if you think of queries, uh, for example, in the context of citation analysis, queries, the results of one query has to be used as the input of the new query. So for example, I wanna get all publications citing a specific publication, and then I wanna do that again recursively. So I want to build a network of uh, citations. So that's a very common use case for the API. Another use case is where um, is when you want to automate query composition. Um, what that means is that you want to essentially run the same query over and over again, maybe at different points in time, once a month, once a year, once a day, uh, because you want to compile a report. Um, a similar use case is when uh, the same query gets run over and over, but you do allow uh, um, someone to fine tune some parameters. So may, for example, you may have a dashboard that exposes some of the parameters in the query. So for example, the publication year or the publication type for a dashboard about publications. And, uh, and this dashboard then would essentially automate queries in the background. So you would use the API for that. And finally, the other common use case for the API is uh, getting more than the 50,000 results um, which is the maximum you can obtain by using the web export functionality. So with the API, uh, we still have a 50,000 maximum results per query. But the thing is with the API, it's so much easier to parameterize your query. 
Um, what that means is that you can segment your query by year or maybe by topic or by journal and obtain less than 50,000 results for each of these queries. And then you can get all of the results together. And so in total, you can easily go up to hundreds of thousands of records. And, uh, um, and, and thus, that is very different from the web application functionality. So Dimensions has three uh, um, API products, uh, main API products. Uh, the most, uh, um, the richest one, I would say, is the uh, Analytics API. Uh, that's a product that contains the most cutting edge features. Uh, we update the Analytics API every two weeks on average. And uh, we continuously try to add more interesting features and to fix errors or maybe to refine existing features based on, on the feedback we get from customers. Um, the Analytics API is mainly targeting analysts and data scientists who have um, sophisticated research questions they want answers for. Um, so some of these queries, they can be very, very complex. So they try to essentially model the uh, um, uh, research domain you're dealing with by using keywords, by using parameters such as years, topics, or uh, publications information, and then pulling out results uh, um, well, different kinds of results via a single query. And we'll see examples of that in a minute. But a key thing to remember here is, is that since these queries that can be particularly complex, in order to guarantee the same level of performance to all of our users, we throttle these queries. Uh, what that means is that you're allowed to have a maximum of 30 queries per minute, something like two query, one query every two seconds. And in most cases for, um, for analysts, for that kind of audience, that is okay. Um, so um, so that's the main, these are the main characteristics of the Analytics API. Now, there are other uh, situations. Uh, for example, when you want to use the API in order to serve data to your existing application, and you do not want to have this limit of 30 queries per minute because you just have to uh, essentially pull out publications or grants or clinical trials information at a regular speed um, all the time. Uh, for these use cases, we have the runtime API. So in this case, there are less controls. So for example, you're not allowed to uh, do group by operations. So operations where you get a list of publications and then you say, um, facet on these publications by year, or maybe facet by research organizations. Essentially, turn the data set around and just show me the most common uh, objects of type X. So these operations are not allowed in the runtime API, but on the other hand, you have unlimited queries. And so the use case for this API is to integrate, is when you want to integrate it, for example, with some search software. And finally, we have the Chris API. Um, the Chris API focuses on research information systems, which are systems um, often used by uh, within uh, academic settings or universities and so on. Um, and they use them to keep track, for example, of what the uh, researchers in a university has been um, doing over the years, what grants he, he, um, he or she has uh, obtained, what publications are, are linked to this researcher and so on. So Chris Systems, uh, they try to maintain an archive to build up a database that can be used internally. And so they want to interface with systems such as Dimensions in order to refine the data set. Uh, so these systems, they're not really interested in performance, speeds, or in sophisticated queries. Very often, the queries are pretty simple. So for, for example, uh, for this researcher's name, give me all publications Dimensions knows about, and, and then storing the data internally. But the key thing in these systems is, to, uh, is for the API to be stable and reliable all the time. So the Chris API, in order to, um, to be as reliable as possible, it doesn't have a an update, a release lifecycle as frequent as the Analytics API. So with the Chris API, we update it maybe once a year or twice a year. So we focus on making sure it's extra stable and it doesn't change too much. Um, and that's the main use case for it. So integration with Chris or RIMS systems. Now, what all of these APIs have in common is the Dimension Search Language, DSL. Um, the Dimension Search Language is our own implementation of a query language for Dimensions data. Um, it's a very powerful query language. Uh, we developed with analysts in mind, 
uh, because we wanted to make sure that also uh, people who do not have a strong uh, programmers or development background, they can still produce sophisticated queries and uh, pull some useful data from the API without having to set up a more complex um, development environment. Um, so the uh, DSL is of course using the English language as the main uh, language for querying the API, and it's normally uh, um, well the queries you will be using are normally based around two phrases. You have a search and a return phrase. Um, in this case, I'm searching for publications, but I could be searching for any of the other content types that mention has, you know, grants, clinical trials, um, data sets, patents, uh, researchers. Um, and, and so on. Um, so in this case, I'm also searching for publications and returning publications, meaning I'm returning the same object type I'm searching for, but I could do uh, uh, something different. I could search for publications and returning, for example, researchers. And what that means is a little bit like doing a goodbye operation in the SQL uh, world. Essentially, I'm returning all the researchers related to those publications. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. Right, so after searching uh, a content type and deciding what to return, I can um, enter a number of constraints for my search. So in this case, I'm putting in a keyword. So I'm searching for matching documents, uh, having that uh, leukemia keyword, and then adding a number of uh, filters. So in this case, here, um, there are many, many filters you can use. Uh, but essentially, the basic query structure is always the same. You search for an object, you put in a uh, keyword uh, constraint, and by the way, you can. There are options for searching only in the title or title and abstract or the full the full text and so on. And then you put in a number of parameters. In this case, here, but I could do uh, constraints on uh, authors, for example, or uh, on a publisher or the research organizations involved, and so on. And just like I mentioned a minute ago, you don't necessarily have to return the same object you're searching for. Um, you can actually return more than one object uh, at the same time. So in this case, I'm returning publications as well as researchers and journals. Um, so what that means is that I'm returning all the researchers linked to these publications, and I'm also extracting all the journals linked to those publications. And of course, there can be more than one publication linked to the same journal. So what this operation does, it groups all of the journals together and it gives you a count for how many publications actually relate to one specific journal. The other thing to mention is that each of these content types have a number of fields and uh, um, the user can control exactly what fields to return. So in this case, I'm returning only title and DOI for publications and the identifier and the last name for researchers and the title only for journals. Right. Um, now, beyond the classic search um, operations in the API, uh, we have a number of functions that we call special functions because they're not properly searching for something, but they kind of carry out a, an operation that has a more complex logic within it. Um, so I'll give you here three examples of these functions. One is called extract affiliations. In this case, you can pass a, um, an affiliation string, uh, which can be as complex as you want. And in the background, using all the knowledge dimension has about organizations uh, and authors and affiliations, we essentially disambiguate that affiliation and we return a grid identifier. Grid, by the way, the Global Research Identifiers database is the main um, is the main inventory of uh, research-related organizations we use in Dimensions. Grid is open source, you can find out more about it online, and it contains around 60,000 organizations, disambiguated organizations um, with uh, um, unique identifiers. So by using that function, you would get an identifier back. And that's used a lot, for example, by people who have uh, um, an internal archive of uh, publications or documents, and you want to associate grid identifiers to them so that you can then use these publications or these documents in combination with other data dimension um, has. Um, another example of functions is the extract concepts function. In this case, we use our internal machine learning models to uh, return keywords from any text you pass to, to the function. Uh, these keywords are not simply noun phrases or nouns from the text, but they are kind of normalized uh, keywords based on the uh, um, 
of the internal uh, statistical analysis we can make of the text based on all the uh, other information that I mentioned knows about. And similarly, we have a classify function that from a title and abstract uh, return a specific uh, taxonomy entry. So uh, you can specify what taxonomy to use. Uh, Dimension knows about um, a handful of taxonomies, including uh, more general ones like the field of research codes and more specific ones. So for example, the ICRP cancer types or the disease categorization. So by using classify, you can essentially go from uh, text to a um, taxonomy entry in a chosen classification. Now, there's so much more to say about the dimension search language. As I mentioned, it's very, very rich, and we're always trying to make it better. And we also uh, try to always keep updated the uh, online documentation that you can find at this uh, web address. Um, so uh, uh, please do take a look at the documentation and uh, if you have any questions, uh, come back to us. We'll be very happy to, to answer them. Right, so in the second part of this presentation, I'll be looking a bit more at the, um, at the number of tools and uh, tutorials we have online that essentially make it easier to uh, get going with the API, to become productive with the Dimensions API. First of all, I should mention that the easiest way to uh, interact with the API is via the Dimensions web application. So the UI has a page, uh, which is normally located at this address, appdimensions.ai slash DSL. Um, on this page, you will find a um, query search box uh, where you can put in a um, um, DSL query string. Um, and the results will come back at the bottom in JSON format. Now, this is a very um, handy way to try things out with the API um, because it's right there in the Dimensions web app. You don't have to install anything. Uh, but of course, it's also a bit of a limited way of, of um, well, it's, it's not a very productive way to, to uh, do things with the API because you can simply get some JSON results back and there's a little bit of a dead end. So you can try things out, but for more, um, uh, real-world um, user scenarios, you probably want to use a different approach. Now, there are, I, think, I think there's two uh, large, broadly speaking, there are two ways of interacting with the API. One is to use third-party softwares that have a data connector of some kind. So, for example, Postman, Click, or Tableau. Um, so, these uh, uh, business intelligence or data analysis tools, they can generally connect to API. So, you would just have to put in your credentials and you can get JSON data back. And then you can normally um, use this data within the software you're using. For example, to produce some visualizations or to create some tables or to extract the data in some other format you're interested in. The second approach, and uh, and I think the most uh, um, creative one, uh, the most flexible one, is by using a programming language. So a number of customers have been using the API using Python, for example, but we also have many others who use R, Java, or any of the um, common programming languages in, in use at the moment. Uh, in particular, we support a lot of Python because that's a language we use a lot internally. And uh, we also have a library for Python called Dimply um, that allows to interact with the API <clears throat> that will make it easier to interact with the API. So Dimply is a uh, um, it's an open source library. You can find it on GitHub um, and essentially simplifies operations such as logging in, logging out. It allows to store your credentials in your computer in a secure way. It allows to perform um, iterative queries. These are essentially queries where you have to paginate through a very large result set. And you, with Dimply, you can do it via one single command. And, and then there's a number of other um, helper uh, functionalities Dimply um, contains. So for example, you can turn any JSON data set into a data frame. A data frame is a uh, Python object, which is very um, common to data scientists. You can think of it a bit as a, an Excel spreadsheet for Python. So you can do more kind of sorting and data manipulation operations once you have data frames. Um, and then I should point out that uh, Dimply also contains a command line interface. Um, a command line interface is a little bit like a software program for your terminal. You don't have to know Python. Uh, you don't. You just have to install Dimply and to run it from your terminal, and that will open up a query console 
that allows you to launch queries to the API um, with the benefit of having an autocomplete system. Essentially, it's a mechanism uh, that uh, suggests um, query operations based on what you're typing. And that's really, really handy if you want to try things out. And just to show you a little bit more about the uh, dimensional search language, I will give an example of uh, um, how the incline works. Um, so here, um, what you can see here is the equivalent of a terminal on uh, on your computer. It's just running within a browser in the context of Jupyter, uh, of a Jupyter notebook. Uh, but uh, the basic operation you would do independently of whether your Windows, Mac, or Unix is the same. You just fire up a terminal, and after installing the incline, you just call it. Uh, so the imply has now loaded, uh, is connected to the API, and uh, I can start searching for things. So as you can see, every time uh, there is a space or a hit tab, there is a number of suggestions popping up. So these are the, for example, the main content types I have in, in dimensions. So let's now maybe imagine we're looking for um, content related to coronavirus, which is obviously a very hot topic at the moment. So I can start typing in my query, and uh, let's just put in the coronavirus keyword like that. And then uh, uh, if I essentially uh, enter nothing else and just hit enter here, uh, Dinkly auto-completes my query, it adds, it adds a return statement. And in this case, I'm returning publications matching this keyword. Now, if I wanna try and put in more um, detailed constraints for my query, I can simply put in a where statement. And what you see here is the full list of um, fields um, available for publications in dimensions. So uh, for example, here, I want to get only publications that have a, a certain number of citations. Um, so by scrolling down here, I can find the time cited um, um, field. So I would say we're time cited major than 100. And uh, let's see, yeah, there's 3000 publications in total. So I'm gonna add more constraints here and I'll say, and uh, research org um, countries, um, country names equal United States. Let's imagine I would like to find out more publications from the US. And now this has gone down to 1500. And uh, at this stage, I do put in a return statement. And as you can see, I can return multiple things. So publications are just one of them. Uh, all the other things I can return, they effectively correspond to a facet or a goodbye operation. So like I mentioned in the beginning, I can essentially extract all of these objects as long as they, uh, if they are related to the publications I'm searching for. So if, for example, I return funders, here um, the results come back as JSON in this case, and uh, I get a list of all the funders related to publications, to, very, to highly cited publications about coronavirus um, in the United States. Uh, the top finder is uh, NIAID, and then a few, I have a few others um, just following that. But uh, let's just imagine, I want to understand who are the people that are uh, highly cited and publishing on this topic. I can simply return researchers, and in this case, I can get back a list of uh, um, um, researchers identifiers. By the way, I should mention that the imply if it's possible, it tries to embellish the results coming back. So in this case, it returns a nice list of uh, researchers' names uh, with an identifier and an actual a link. I can just take and open up in, in dimensions in case I wanna check things out using the, using the interface. So that's the page for, for our researcher here. But um, the data coming back is always visible by running the JSON command. So I can, for example, do JSON full, and that shows you exactly how the data come back uh, from the API. So for every researcher, I have uh, uh, identifiers, name, surname, and a list of research organizations that person has been associated with over the years. Right, so uh, that gives you a, um, a uh, an idea of what Dinkly can do. So let me get back to the presentation. All right, so 
Another resource, another uh, open source resource we have, which is very useful to, for people to get started, is the API Lab. Um, this is a website and a collection of Jupyter Notebooks that uh, uh, give you a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, tutorial of how to carry out uh, scholarly data analytics tasks. So sometimes these tasks are, well, in most cases, these tasks are not just one query, but uh, it's a number of different queries in a sequence with some data manipulation um, steps in between. So for example, you may want to calculate the H, in, H index of a researcher. That means looking at all the publications for that researcher, looking at the citations counts, the years, and then coming up with an algorithm that calculates the number. Or you may want to look at the international and industry collaboration for a uh, research organization. That means starting from a research organization, extracting all the publications, looking at the other organizations linked to those publications, and then doing some kind of segmenting of the data based on the geographical um, information of those organizations. And uh, these operations, they normally take different steps. Uh, but once you've done it a couple of times, you learn that the steps are always the same. So that's why we're putting together um, these notebooks uh, in such a format that you can simply download them and uh, modify a few parameters and rerun them again locally so that you can essentially make them relevant for your specific use case. Um, we're uh, regularly adding new notebooks uh, to, this, uh, to this resource, also based on your feedback. And I should also mention that all the notebooks are compatible with Google Colab. Google Colab is a fully cloud-based Jupyter environment, meaning that you can simply click on the opening Colab link and run this notebook online without having to install anything on your computer. So essentially that makes it very, very easy to get up and running with this analysis, even though you don't have a fully working uh, development environment on your computer. So that's the API Labs environment. Um, as, a, as a final, uh, um, the final thing I'd like to mention is the Google Sheets Data Connector. Uh, this is something which uh, uh, is not um, available yet. Uh, it's actually being scrutinized by Google. Hopefully it will become available over the next couple of weeks or so. Um, and essentially this is a plugin for Google Sheets. It's a, it's a free plugin that allows to connect to the Dimensions API to write queries directly from the uh, a Google Sheet panel and to get the results data back in a tabular format. And uh, um, the nice thing about this add-on is that for people who are uh, um, keen or, or used to using uh, Google Sheets a lot, you can have the data right there in a Google Sheet and then take advantage of the many other features Google Sheets have. So for example, building uh, pivot tables or charts or building other sheets that essentially depend on the data coming from the DSL. Um, for power users, there are also ways to essentially refresh the Google Sheets um, a specific time periods, so you can always have fresh data coming from dimensions and maybe having some other visualizations or dashboards building on that data. So this opens up a number of possibilities, especially for people who are um, who already have some experience with uh, um, with Google Sheets, and we're very much looking forward to making this available to you guys as well. So um, please keep an eye on the announcements because it will become available very very soon. And that brings me to the end of this uh, introductory uh, um, presentation about the Dimensions APIs. Thanks a lot for your attention. Um, I hope you now understand more about the API and why it is useful. Um, please get in touch via that email address or the sales rep you're in touch with if you have questions. And also uh, we have a users forum, um, which uh, you can uh, sign up to. And uh, that's what we use to communicate news about the APIs and also when we have new notebooks in the API lab and in general tutorials that people can use, we would always send a message to this users forum. So please uh, use that link to, um, to sign up on it. And uh, thanks again for your attention and hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye.